How's it going? Andrew here and welcome to the Creative Endeavor podcast. The podcast bringing you inspiring stories from creative professionals from around the world. And in this episode, I'm talking to Thomas Fluharty, who's an amazing caricature artist based in the United States. His work has been featured on the cover of Time Magazine, Der Spiegel, and Mad Magazine. And I just absolutely love his artwork. Naturally, I wanted to reach out to Thomas and have a chat to him and talk about not only his fantastic art and how he creates it, but also a little bit about his personal story and what inspires him. Now, this was a great conversation. I know you're gonna get a heck of a lot out of this one. So without further ado, here's Thomas Fluharty in The Creative Endeavor. Well, Thomas Fluharty, it is an absolute pleasure to meet you. Welcome to the Creative Endeavor podcast. It's awesome. Thank you, Andrew, for having me on. It's super cool to, you know, uh, talk about what we're going to talk about. It's, I love art. I love making images, and it's, it's an honor to do it. Oh, pe- fantastic, man. Fantastic. Well, look, before we get stuck into your fantastic art, I- I'd like to hear a little bit more about your personal story and maybe a bit about how you got started in art in the first place. Yeah. So, I mean, um, like like almost all my friends, you know, um, I was just drawing uh, as a kid. It's just what I did. And uh, I just came naturally to me. And it was between me and this other kid in art school, in, uh, in first grade. Uh, and you know, I was just drawing, like nobody had to tell me how to draw or no, no one had to tell me, please now draw now. It was just like, I was just drawing, like I was drawing, eating cereal. I was drawing in the kitchen while my mom was cooking and I was drawing the blinds or, you know, the, the, the curtains. And I was drawing as I would eat Quisp and Captain Crunch. I was like drawing the back of the box and I was just, just drawing like, like a, like a madman. And, you know, uh, I mean, I was playing sports and stuff like that, but I just, just, I drew from the TV guide. So, you know, that was back in the seventies. So I just drew all the time and everybody knew I drew. So, uh, you know, I drew my dad, I drew my mom and they were really bad drawing, but I was drawing. That's the whole point. Like, why are you drawing? And then that person is not drawing as much. So everyone is drawing, but what is it about the person that just freaking just keeps drawing and just like is like intensely drawing so I'm just intensely drawing like my other friends are as well probably like you as well so then around um you know uh somewhere around the eighth grade I uh I started getting into drugs and uh I got high for the first time and that kind of messed with me and I stopped drawing I stopped doing art and then um that was, uh, I, you know, ninth grade rolled around. We moved to another school and I got really immersed in drugs pretty bad. And then um, uh, 10th grade rolled around and I, I had a bad trip on LSD. I was uh, just art was nowhere to be found. But uh, I was really uh, completely into drugs. And this one friend said, hey, my friend draws. And I said, oh, I draw. And, uh, it, I, I went home and drew something for him and, and showed him. And I don't think I probably drew for five, six years. And, uh, it was just that one person just saying something. It was like this, 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 uh, extension of like an olive leaf or some sort of like a, a rope out of darkness. Like someone was extending me something or just said something to me. I took it, I drew. And then like all of a sudden I'm in the 10th grade. And I go to this um, uh, art, uh, I go to art class, I, I, I get into an art class. And this one teacher, Shirley Harbaugh, says, Tom, you can do this, you can do this. And like, my father wasn't around because he was an alcoholic. And he was just kind of like, you know, gone out of the picture. But my mom loved me, uh, you know, and, and you know, um, I mean, I had a good childhood, you know, but um, at this point, my 10th grade teacher starts saying, Tom, you, you can do this. Your drawings are really good. And I start actually hearing like this, this interest and I start getting excited about art again. Um, and then, um, so then uh, when the 10th grade is over, I mean, I would go to, I would go to a 10th grade art class completely stoned because it was right 
after lunch. And that's when I uh, would bring in these big bongs and stuff and we'd fill it up with pot and go and go to class completely stoned out of my mind. But I would hand in these drawings and started like thinking and hoping and like thinking about drawing. And she said, you could do this. So then she said, 11th grade, you could go to a vocational school. And I was like, vocational school? And, I, and, then, and then she's like, yeah, but you'd have to leave your friends. I looked at my friends. I was like, these aren't really my friends. These are stoners, you know? I mean, I'm a stoner. I'm not, I'm not like, there's nothing to really leave here. Um, and so they're like, she's like, yeah, you could go to joint vocational school and do art all day. They have a commercial art program. I was like, dude, that's awesome. So I went and showed them my book, my work. And uh, the 11th grade teacher came over and visited, my, visited me. And... Um, I was like, yeah, you're accepted. And I, and I went in 11th grade, you know, I'm learning about all these great illustrators, you know, Hey, Mark English, Bob Peake, uh, Maxfield Parrish. I never heard these names before. And I was like, all of a sudden I'm drawing every day. I'm like designing, I'm like studying printing because there's a printing room right next door and it's a vocational school. That's all I'm doing is art. I don't have to do math anymore because I suck at math and I hate math. And it's like, you know, it's just stupid. Like I was it's like, I'm never going to use the alphabets to solve the math problems. I mean, I hate math. So it was like, this was something I freaking loved. I was like, this is intense. So I start designing, uh, you know, drawings. I start like composing images. I start, I started uh, working at a racquetball club and I start drawing and composing, um, images for like a, a racquetball poster and stuff. But all of a sudden I'm thinking about art. And then I, I, after the 11th grade, I get into the 12th grade and this teacher uh, named Jack Wellbaum, uh, he's like this super positive guy. And he's like, Tom, you can do anything you set your mind to. And I was like, I was like, I never heard that before. You know, I was always like second string. Like I couldn't be great. I couldn't be good. Uh, that dude, he's awesome. He plays basketball. I'm on the second string. I could never, you know, like my, my, my mentality was like, I could never be good. I'm just second string or whatever. But I just didn't have anybody that really got, got into my head and told me if I set my mind on something that I could do it. And so uh, this teacher, man, he like, he started like getting into my head and like just talking to me and then my father came back into the scene and and he started like saying you know tom so i'm a senior my friends are going to go to um, art school and my father's like tom you're going to go to school one way or another and he'd see my drawings and he would start crying and he was like you're going to school one way or another and i was like you know i was like you don't have any money you know and uh he, he worked in the bar business and uh, you know, he, he was he was a good man. It wasn't like he was a complete loser. He was just kind of so bound up that he, he was just so messed up in that sense of just drinking um, that it just he just wasn't able to be there for us, you know. And it was a bit of a drag, really. But what happened, uh, Andrew, was uh, one night uh, my friends were like, dude, let's go party. And I'm like, no, I got to go see my father. And this is like in, this is July, 1981. And I, I'm graduating in like, I might've even been graduated in July. I think I was, I was already graduated. I'm just waiting. Am I going to art school or not? My friend's like, dude, you coming to art school? And I'm like, I don't know. Dude, all of a sudden I see my father on a Friday night. I wake up in the morning and I get this phone call from my uh, stepmother. And she's like, Tom, is your father there? And I'm like, no. And she's like, I'm like, why? What's going on? She's like, your father never came home last night. He might have been killed in a robbery. I was like, what? It just flipped me out, you know? And uh, I was like, oh, my gosh. I hung up the phone. I said, call me back when you know. I hung up the phone. I'm like, it better not be true. better not be true. Called my sister. Uh, she calls, makes phone calls, calls me back like 20 minutes later and says, Tommy, it's true. And she's just bawling. And my my whole world fell apart, like, it was just crushed. So he got killed. He was basically murdered in this bar. And I'm so sorry. the bizarre thing was, uh, it's, it's okay. It's just the way that it went down, you know. But it's crazy, Andrew, because when that happened, I got to go to school, art school, totally for free. And because he was killed on the job, I got workman's comp and social security. 
and I got advanced placement because I had already been through, you know, 11th and 12th grade of a vocational school. So it was insane. So I go, all of a sudden, this door opens up and I walk through it. Now I'm in Pittsburgh and uh, I'm like, I'm going to do this for my father. I'm going to be the best. I'm going to do this and do that, you know. And then, um, you know, I stopped basically, you know, getting so wasted, but I was still drinking and stuff. But Basically, I uh, I was drawing a lot of uh, rock stars and stuff, and I went and saw this one art director in Dayton, Ohio, when I would go home for Christmas, and he'd say, "Tom, oh, I said, hey, can I come in and see you?" I said, "I saw you, I, you know, you, you, you know, I, I met you a while ago, but would you be able to look at my work?" He said, "Sure." He opens up the door in this cool agency in Dayton, Ohio, which was full of illustrators, and he looks at my work and he says. Um, look, you draw Pete, uh, Pete Townsend and Mick Jagger really cool, but I don't buy P Pete Townsend and Mick Jagger. You need to make yourself marketable. He goes, have you ever done markers? I said, no. He said, do markers and your foot is in the door. I was like, oh my gosh. I went back to art school and did markers. I took this marker class and everything I did was in markers, everything. And I was always wanted to be a, a, a an illustrator. Like I was like, I was on fire. Like this was my only hope. This is all I have. Like, I don't have any other skill sets. I'm like, being an artist is it, man. So I, uh, I learned markers and I graduate and I was, I had this one offer in, in Pittsburgh to uh, do renderings for the newspaper. They kept blowing me off. And then finally my friends were like, dude, you flew, you want to live in New York city. Why don't you send your work to New York city? And so, uh, I, um, I sent my work to uh, two places in New York City. There was a book called The Black Book. It was a source book showing uh, these different places in New York that uh, hired illustrators. And out of the blue one day, I get a call from this gruff New Yorker. And he's like, you Tom Flew Hardy? I was like, yeah. And he's like, you draw? I was like, yeah. And he's like, you draw out of your head? I was like, no. He's like, well, come on up and, and, we'll, and we want to meet, meet you and look at your work. We love your work. I was like, that's insane. So they fly me up to New York. I'm 21 years old. And um, I try out for a week. And there's a dude working there named Ken Bald, who's, uh, he just actually passed. He's one of my dear friends, but he was 98. So at that time, in 1983, He's 65. This dude's been around the block. He's best friends with Stan Lee. He did, did Dr. Kildare of uh, Dark Shadows. He drew those comics. And he did um, uh, Captain America. So he, um, if you have to stop me anywhere in here, please. No, keep you know, going, man. Um, riff, I, I, riff, this, riff. This, I love this. <laughs> keep going. Yeah, sorry. This, <laughs> this, I, I can no, ramble. I love it. But That's a point. So, so all of a sudden... Uh, I, I realized like this dude's insanely awesome. This guy can draw his butt off. And I, I'm like, I really want this job. And so I trained for a week and they say, Tom, you got this job. Uh, do you want it? And I was like, sure. And they're like, we'll pay you $250 a week. And I was like, uh, okay, I, I, awesome. So this was in 1983. Uh, they, I, I, I move up and I start that job at Gem Studios. It was like the premier storyboard uh, age up. Uh, uh, house and in, in basically in the world, uh, especially in New York City, we worked for every major agency, BBDNO, Young and Rubicon, um, I mean, just everything. It was insane. And uh, I just drew my butt off like every day. We'd work 15 hours a day. And I started out drawing hands and, and that were like holding a Coke can or something. And Ken would do all the figures and I would color them with my markers. And uh, after about a year, I renegotiated my contract and said, dudes, I, I want $500 a week. And they were like, I ought to kick you out of my office. I ought to kick you out. And I was like, he's like, but I like you. All right, we're going to give you 500, but you're, you're mine. And I was like, I'm okay, dude. And so I just worked my butt off and I just drew like crazy. You have to, in storyboards, especially for agencies, you're drawing everything and you're drawing from the ground up, meaning you don't have a photo. You have to learn how to draw from a grid and construct as if you see this scene that doesn't exist. And I'm using reference and I'm shooting pictures for myself and stuff like that. But it's, it's, it's like hardcore boot camp drawing fundamentals of like insanity. And so I did that. After a few years, I became sought after uh, while I worked there. And uh, my whole goal was just to... Um, 
to just learn how to draw. And I didn't, I still wanted to do magazines and stuff like that. But I was like, no, nah, man, I'm just going to draw. I'm just going to learn how to draw. So I drew thousands of hours um, in, in incredible, incredibly difficult situations and stress, stress moments of just intensity and rejection and just all this nonsense that happens in storyboards for all these agencies in New York City. And so I did that and uh, for 13 years. And that was so crazy. Uh, at one point, we were going to leave uh, 10 years in. And they said, hey, we know you're leaving, but we haven't given you a contract. We haven't given you an offer. Would you stay? And I said, oh, I, don't really, I, don't, I don't really want to know what's in that envelope. They were handing me an envelope. And I was like, I don't really want to know because I don't want that to really be the, the whole reason why we stay. We're leaving. And then we had this lunch. They took me out to lunch. And then I finally looked in the envelope and I was like, oh, my gosh, this is crazy. So they like they gave me a house allowance. They gave me a car allowance. They gave me a fifteen thousand dollar raise. I don't mean any of this as a brag. No, I'm just trying man, to say it's it, 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 it's 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 interesting. Like people don't know story, and so the, these these stories of how somebody gets someplace is it's necessary. It's helpful, and so like all of a sudden, for they, they promised me that my boss would be out of the picture, and uh, the one boss that I was having problems with. And this one dude uh, was my other young boss. He wrote me the contract, and then he left a year and a half in. All of a sudden, I'm left back with my other bosses for the remaining year and a half. So it was a three-year contract. And then I finished that out. And then I was like, I had already been studying uh, painting and, and, and caricature. This was around 92. I started studying caricature. I went over to Mad Magazine. While I was still doing storyboards, my heart was just wanting to be doing editorial and be known as an editorial illustrator. No one would give me the time of day. They'd all say, hey, you know, your work looks like this person. And so I went over to Mad Magazine in 92 and they, they, they gave me some constructive criticism. And I worked on my book for two, uh, three more years, went back over. And this is in 95. I have one year left on my contract at the storyboard place. And out of the blue, they gave me this cover for Mad Magazine. I was like, oh, my gosh. They, they took me in. It was insane. I actually, I posted about it on Instagram. I don't know if you saw that. But if anybody wants to see the story, it's on Instagram. But basically, they gave me that cover. And that rocked my world. That was insane. Like, that was just, like, insane. Uh, and then after that, I finished out my last year there at Gem Studio. And then I went freelance, moved to uh, Minneapolis and with my wife. We had three kids at the time. Uh, and then we moved here to Minneapolis. I started doing storyboards. I started, um, you know, doing caricature. And then out of the blue, the New York Times tracked me down because I had left them a, um, a um, you know, a crazy sort of list, a, 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 a mailer. And they tracked me down. And just all this stuff just just uh, happened with the New York Times. And what, what the story about that, Andrew, which is interesting, was um, they called me up and said, dude, you're hard to get a hold of. Uh, this was So this was 96. I just moved. We're like three or four months into 96 after we moved here. And uh, they tracked me down. And the dude says, uh, boy, you're really hard to get a hold of. This was before the Internet. And, uh, and he said, uh, hey, we have this job for you. We want you to do Jerry Lewis. Uh, and it's five illustrations, five caricatures, and we'll pay you $500. And I was like, five caricatures for $500. That's a hundred dollars a piece. Really? I was like, that's, I said, let me think about this. I knew it was the New York times and I knew it was the Sunday New York magazine, which is gigantic. Cause I lived in New York. And so I knew exactly what it was. So I called him back and I said, Hey, Paul. Uh, Paul Jean is his name. He's a good guy, actually. He, I think he still works there. And, he, and I called him back. I said, hey, you know what? I can't do 500 but I said, you make it 750 and, I, and I'm in. He's like, okay. I was like, dude. So we did it, 750 750 bucks. And um, when it came out, I, I, it opened up every door. Like, I knew if I took that small amount as opposed to, you know, be a jerk, like, no, it's got to be 4000 bucks. I knew if I just looked the other way and really uh, just fit it in that it, it, I took a small amount because I knew what ultimately it 
the power of it. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, this was back in the day of answering machines. I'm not making this up. I'm not bragging. But but I literally worked for every magazine at that point. I started doing a weekly gig for Outside Magazine. I, I was already doing a weekly gig for a monthly gig for Mad Magazine. Uh, I, uh, the GQ called, People Magazine called. So for 98, 1998, Time Magazine called. I, I did the cover of Time in 98. Just these opportunities that 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 happened. But to be fair, I wasn't really. I didn't know what I was doing. I I I I I hadn't arrived by any means, and I haven't arrived yet. And it's like this whole idea that like, oh, here's my style. This is it. No, this stuff happens through years of repetition and years of failure, years years of struggle. Now, your failures aren't going to be consistently terrible all the time. But you have to work through a bunch of bunch of mediocrity, and I'm still working through it on any given day. But I'm at a place right now where now through all of this stuff that's been going on in my life of just creating and figuring out who I am. Um, but basically, it you know, I'm, I'm at a place now where I'm really happy and comfortable with what I'm doing. But back in '98, even when I was doing editorial work. I, 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 looking back at my work, I cringe at it because I'm like, oh my gosh, I was trying so hard. And yet I was doing work for Mad and New York Times and Time Magazine and stuff. And it was cool, but it was where I cut my teeth. It took me about, it took me, Andrew, about 12 years to figure out caricature. I, it, 12 years of repetition, 12 years. And what I mean by that was uh, what happened was uh, Der Spiegel uh, finally got the cover of Der Spiegel. And this was, I don't know, I don't know when this was, t- uh, 2002 or something like that. I'm not sure. But basically, uh, I did the cover. I was like, awesome. I did the cover of Der Spiegel. He goes, Tom, we d- d- can't use the cover. It doesn't work. It's too crazy. I was like, what are you talking about? Too crazy. He's like, let me give you a hint. This is what he said. He said, and he's a great art director. His name's uh, Stefan uh, Kiefer. Stefan said, Tom, your work is freaky. Our client base is conservative. Our readers are conservative. If you draw George Bush on a globe shooting his guns and he's all skinny, it's scary looking. He goes, if you can tone your work down and make it less freaky, you'll get more work. And at that point, I took that advice, that failure of, not, of blowing the cover and I went and did this next image of George Bush as a cowboy, and it was night and day. It actually was going to win a gold medal, at, but somebody didn't vote for it. But it was just like this stuff of like, it was like I, I knew I was on to something at that point. And that was like around 2000 and 2002 or something like that. And then so right around that time, I had started studying the masters. I started like... I had just been an illustrator based off of the only experience I had was like rooted in art school and studying on my own. But right around 2003, I said, I want to start painting oils. And um, so I started, I went down to a a painter here in Minneapolis and I just immersed myself in his class. Every Wednesday I went down there and I painted for about three years. I studied with Jeff Hernanko. And so this takes me up from 2003 to 2006 and it took me about three years to figure it out, like to actually be able to create an underpainting. He, this dude was speaking Chinese to me. Like I never heard about value. I never heard about rounding form. I, I just was drawing. And he goes, your work is very linear. So I was copying photographs. I was an illustrator for what? I don't know, 20 years. But he rocked my world. It was like, oh my gosh, I don't know anything. And it was crazy. So right about that time, that's when that's when I really started learning because I started studying with, uh, you know, a masterful approach, classical education. And then around 2010, I started teaching at Schoolism. Uh, I, I had been painting all the time with Dutch Flemish. And uh, and then uh, a little bit after that, I started studying with Joe Paquette, who's a, an amazing landscape painter. And he's the bomb. The dude is a beast. So I studied. I studied for two years with him, uh, and uh, for the last two years, every Wednesday night with Joe, and he rocked my world. That that dude rocked my world. I didn't know what I was doing, even then, until I studied with him. And it's like, wow. So I, I, the last two years, uh, things have really solidified, 
and um, I, I, I'm moving, so I'm gonna. I, I want to keep studying with him uh, because he's not speaking as much Chinese as he was in the beginning. Uh, but I'm understanding certain sentences that he's saying now. You mean so you're learning? You're learning Chinese. You yeah. can <laughs> absolutely. I'm learning Chinese. So at the, at the first time, first year, I was like, Joe, I don't understand anything you just said. Uh, second year, I'm like, hey, I, I think I, I heard a sentence that you said finally. I understand that sentence. So I'm understanding more and more, but I still need to study with them and because it, it's deep. You know what I mean? So anyways, that's a long – I'm sorry. It's just a, a long-winded – No, like, look, know. Thomas, that's, that's fantastic, and I really appreciate you sharing so much of your story and being so open with me about this. There is so much there that I want to go back to and, and, and unpack, but again, I really appreciate this, and it's just an amazing opportunity for me to have a chance to connect with you because I've been looking at your work for years and, and following you on Instagram for a long time. And every time I see one of your your pictures come up on my Instagram feed, it just I I get this reaction. It's just there, I react to it on on a number of levels. When I look at it, I, I see somebody who not only has an, an enormous capacity for the material, but also just you you know your subject inside and out and. I, I do want to unpack the caricature side of things because I, I really love your characters. And then, you know, you're, you're different things from the mad, mad world of dogs to sharks to superheroes, all that stuff. I want to talk about that. But I want to go back to something that you said because there's this, there's this thing, I, I get a feeling about you where uh, maybe I, I reflect a little bit of this as well because I, I, I get triggered in a way when I hear from my you know, subscribers and followers, and, and when they're emailing me something, they're, they're talking about, they have a plan A and a plan B. And when they're thinking about their creative direction, their creative journey in their life, it's like, well, yeah, if the art doesn't work out, I'm going to go study medicine. Or if this doesn't work out, I'm going to go into, uh, I'm going to go into be accounting or whatever, you know, because at least I can make some money that way. For a guy like you, though, it sounds like there there ain't no plan B. There was never another option. And for me, I was a serious kid. I was a real serious kid. If you asked me, you know, what, what are you going to be when you grow up? I would have said, I am an artist now, and that's not going to change. And I would have yeah, said yeah. that to you as, as a 12-year-old. Awesome. That's but, awesome. And then that's it was awesome. in high school. I was like, no, it's art or death. <laughs> so I was, that's really, awesome. I was really serious. Yeah. And, and I imagine you were a bit like that also. Yeah, I mean, it, it's actually just understanding um, that I don't have anything. I, I don't, I, I don't have anything. I don't have anything else that I can do. I mean, I, I'm decent at sports, but I can't make a living. You know, I'm not like I'm average. Uh, but you know what I mean? Like, it's just this is something that is it's who I am. Like, I mean, you, you, I mean, I drive down this, the, the road and I almost get in a wreck because I'm looking at a shadow on a barn. I mean, I'm just saying we're all like this. I mean, the artists that are intense, they, like I'm intense. Like this is like in this is like this is an intensity of like of life and living and breathing and eating it. I can't wait to go draw. So but it hasn't. I mean, it's always been that way, but more so in the last few years, I feel like. I'm starting to create at a level that I'm, 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 I'm feeling different. And a lot of it's just by studying with great people and then starting to actually believe that I can do this um, and I can create. And uh, I mean, I see so much amazing talent. Uh, it's insane how great my friends are. They're insane. And yet I don't have to be better. I just, I just need to just work out, you know, what I'm doing. So this whole, like you said, you know, this idea, I don't have anything else I can do. I don't have anything else. I don't have a plan B. I, I mean, the only thing I've done is I've just sought to learn things as much as possible uh, about business, about thinking properly, um, thinking about social media. How are my friends doing it? What are you doing? How, what's your camera you're using? W what about, you know, what about, you know, and I built my site in 20, uh, 2013, Pascal Campion, who's an amazing artist. He's a friend of mine as well. Dude's insanely awesome. He's like, I can't believe you, uh, you didn't have a site. You don't have a store. 
And I'm like, I, I, now I do. But at the time, I was like, I didn't. So I'm saying I pick these people's brains and I become talented or smarter because they're a wealth of information. And, and all the great artists are humble. Like, nobody's an idiot. I mean, there are idiots. They're insecure and they're afraid because they know that they're not as good as they you know, everybody knows they're not as great as they, they think they are or whatever. But I'm saying the great artists are always humble and they're they're amazing. Like John Navarro, if you ever met and got to hang out with John Navarro, honestly, this dude is insane. Bobby Chu is the same way. These guys are super humble. You know, so it's like getting around these people, you can grow and learn. And to get back to your question, this is all I have. So I, I use my time. And I use all the, all the networking and, and, and the friendships that I have as I try to respond to people. I don't try to be an idiot. I don't try to be, be a jerk to anybody because you never know. That person that, that isn't that great could grow up to be a monster and they can be incredible. And, and just if you can help them along the way, like we're all trying to help each other. This is, nobody has the market. Like nobody, even, even the, the artists I've named, they're limited. That we're all limited. We're not awesome at everything, you know. So we, we we're all like trying to help each other, and and I think that's the cool thing about it. It's it's interesting because I think there's a couple of reactions reactions that you can have when you're when you're looking at art today and some of these heavy hitters, these these amazingly talented painters, sculptors, you know, draftsmen. There, there's there's just an amazing abundance of people. You just open up your phone, jump on Instagram, and there's there's one or two reactions. And and I must admit, I and I I, you know, I'm guilty of this. Early on, when I'd look at other artists, I would get insanely jealous. I'd get really jealous and be like, man, I'm nowhere near where I want to be. And it wasn't until maybe about eight or nine years ago that I was just like, you know what? It ain't about this. It ain't, it's, it's not a competition. It's not about where I fit in some sort of rank. There's room for everybody. And it doesn't matter who I'm, who I'm dealing with or who I'm looking at there. Everybody's my senior in some way. There's something that I can learn here. I, I feel now like this is, it, it's a party and there's a massive conversation that's happening and we all have something, a little something different to say. And now it's this is the 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 such a great joy for me to reach out, connect with people like yourself and 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 others, and share these stories with people. I think it's awesome. It's just an awesome awesome time right now to be an artist. It is, um, you know, Andrew. Honestly, the rescuing thought I have that rescues me from the insanity of competing with people is, I mean, that's insane. Here, here, this is humbling. Okay, this is what I remember every day, no matter what I create, uh, no matter what I make. Um, and I believe this to be true, and I can back it up. I'm going to die and be forgotten. Bottom line. And the reason why I say that is, it's the fact. But I went to the, I went to the Met or some gallery in Russia. I think it was. I think it was the Met. And I said, Hey, I want to see the Bougaros. And they said, Oh, Bougaros in the basement. So I was like, wait, Bougaro is in the basement? They're like, yeah, he's not popular. I was like, that is incredible. If Bougaro's in the basement, Flu Hardy won't even make it to the basement. That's the point. And so it's like, it doesn't matter. I'm not going to try to make it in a museum. I'm not going to, I'm just not going to be, I'm not going to let that ruin my life or ruin my joy. Do you know what I mean? It isn't that I don't want to create intensely and that I don't want to pursue excellence. I want to be awesome at what I do. I want it to be intense. But you also have Zorns. You have Sergeants. You know what I mean? These guys are on, on Stratus. They're, they're like on, um, they're on another planet. And I'll never be at that place. So therefore, relax, draw, enjoy, and create and network, be buddies with these amazing artists. Some of them might go into history, but to, to even have that be a jacket that you put on or a weight or whatever, man, there are too many amazing artists around. But the one thing that's cool is that not everyone has the market on everything. Nobody's awesome at everything. You know what I mean? Like you have to do one thing over and over and over and over and own that one thing. That's the that's what's going to give you a voice. Like my drawings right now aren't because I'm trying to do anything. I just can't get enough of it. 
And it's like, I'm not trying to make a, a voice, but it's, it's, I'm, hitting, I'm hitting a nerve that is a nerve that I'm hitting for me in my soul and, and who I am as an artist that I can't get enough. I just can't get enough of it. And so it's starting to create a, uh, a sort of a, a recognition or like, hey, and people will say, uh, oh, I love your blue line stuff or have you seen his blue line stuff? It's like, I'm not trying to make a voice. I'm just saying, Whatever it is we're doing, I'm striking a, I'm striking a nail every single day, every day, every day, every day. And I'm not drawing Hillary just to put up for a post. I just did an Indian the other day, but that was just because I was inspired. But I'm not going down an Indian road, you know what I mean? Or, or I was doing dogs for a while. I haven't completely bailed, but I am extremely distracted. Things excite me. But I'm trying to stay focused. And the one thing I keep coming back to is the drawing that for me, there's nothing above drawing. Drawing is it. If people are responding to anything in my paintings, it's the drawing. And I'm going to develop as a painter. I'm going to develop as a painter for the rest of my life. But I'm not going to lose sleep if I'm not that great at it. I'm just going to keep working it. But I'm going to draw every day. I'm going to draw all the time. And I'm going to try to figure it out. You see what I mean? Like, it's like, cause drawing is it. Drawing is it. It's, it's all there is. And I know people might like, what are you talking about? It, at the end of the day, you're only, you only paint as good as you draw. So my point here is to say, draw as much as you can. Develop, draw, study with great people. Try to draw as much as you can. It, wow. Yeah, it, it sounds, I mean, again, you're, you're, you're in it really it sounds like to scratch the the creative itch that's within you as soon as you focus on something external you know something maybe ego based well i hope they're talking about me in this group i hope the establishment accepts me or whatever at the end of the day who gives a crap like it's about what's inside because you're here to bring to this whatever you were given and really speak with your voice i think I, I had a big dose of this when I, again, when I was a bit younger, I, I really so desperately wanted to matter. And it's only been very recently where I thought a bit like you but with Bougaro in the, in the basement, you know, I, I don't think, I, I can almost say for certainty that I, that I know that I, in a historical concept, context, won't be remembered. So what is it about? And for me now, it, it it's so much about the process. It's so much about... And also helping people with the process. I, I'm getting way more, way more validation out of actually helping people because I believe that creativity and expressing yourself creatively is a fundamental human right. And that life and society, we're not set up in such a way that actually explores that and celebrates that. You know, we're, we're it, the school system. And again, you know, maybe back to the school days here, but but the school system for me as well, it, I felt so much like they were trying to put me in a box and turn me into a factory worker. I was like, well, I, I, I don't give a crap about math or science or geography or English or anything. I'm going to draw pictures. I'm going to draw pictures in my school file. And uh, <laughs> that's that was me. There, there was something I was going to say. There was something I was going to say real quick. And and. It, it kind of got away from us. So then I debated on bringing it up, but you know, you talked about helping people. Um, I firmly believe in that. I think that when we, when we take our skill and we spread it out and we say, uh, you know, I, I'm here to help you. I'm here to, to, if you got a question, sh shoot me a question. Because we're, as artists, we're sort of uh, artistically bipolar. I'm not making light of bipolar. What I'm getting at is we draw. I'm awesome. This is awesome. Oh, my gosh. That's so incredible. And we go to lunch, come back. That sucks. Bru oh or or it's, like, yeah. it's like, I suck today. Yeah. I suck today. I suck today. I su and so we beat ourselves up. We crush ourselves. But all of a sudden, if some great artist likes my work, all of a sudden, I'm like, oh, my gosh. I can't believe it. And I'm like, up again. And I'm like, down. I'm up. Uh, oh, that didn't get that many likes. Oh, that's, I suck. Oh, uh, I shouldn't have posted. I'm just saying, we're like all over the map, right? But when we can look at what we're doing and say, uh, you know, I've been doing this now 35 years. I say, somebody just shot me a, 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 a note. They took the time to say, I love your work. I'm a huge fan. Thanks for what you do. You inspire me. And if I ignored that, if I ignored that, I'm, 
my opinion, I'm an idiot. I, 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 people that don't respond bother me. Here, here's what I'm getting at. When I was 16 and messed up, no one looked at me, no one cared, but there was this one person, Joel Kraft. I remember his name to this day, and he paid attention to me, and he, he was kind of a cool kid, and he said something to me, and he actually acknowledged me. It, it changed my day. It like gave me hope because somebody actually acknowledged me, and it was like I was so broken that when this person just paid attention to me and just acknowledged me and he was cool, I was like, oh my gosh, he's, a, he's, he's befriending me. He's actually, I'm just saying it changed me, right? And it gave me hope. And so it's like when people write me, I, I just respond back. I'm like, thank you or whatever. And it's like, you can change somebody's day and you could actually go over to their page, like two things and then jump off and go about your day. And then they're like, that freaking dude like two of my drawings. And like, you, you know what I mean? Like you can change somebody's day very with very little effort. I mean, it, it, what, what does it take for you to look at his work, like three things and move on? I'm just saying we are, we need to be sort of uh, encouraged as artists and artists, especially because we're so over all over the map. As artists, we are. We need it. We're. It's a community project, is what it is. It's not a solo endeavor. And these, when it becomes a solo endeavor, then we become arrogant. We become competitive, and we don't have any friends. You know, oh, and nobody yeah, yeah, wants yeah. to be around you. No one wants to hang out you know with that guy. I mean? No, <laughs> no. He's like you're. You're an idiot. I mean, yeah. who cares? I don't care that you're good. You're an idiot. Yeah, yeah. You know yeah, what I absolutely, mean? Absolutely, absolutely. And at the end of the day, I mean, when when you're around people like that, it just it, it's almost like smelling salts. It just hits you. It's like whoa. And it's like yeah. There, there's nothing there. There's nowhere else you can move. There's nothing you can say. There's no end. It's just like okay. I, I react to it very badly now. And um, when I was just first starting out, and and again, you know. Facebook was just starting as well, and I was trying to work out how to get out, get myself established online. Um, it was there was a lot of people that I reached out to, and, and for the most part, many people never responded, never wrote back via email, never uh, never heard anything. But the ones that did, that really went above and beyond, really paid attention. I had one guy on here on the podcast, Brendan Darby. I reached out to him. Shout out Brendan Darby. I reached out to him when I was just coming out of university. And um, he, he just basically just sent me this really long email and just said, here, kid, this is what you got to do. And I was like, wow. <laughs> and, you know. See, that's it, cool. It, I like that. It was advice, you know, a bit like what you're saying, you know, it was, you have to be dedicated to this thing. You have to be prepared to spend a period of, of time like 10 years. So I imagine when you're saying something like spending 12 years just to get your head around caricature, oh my goodness. You know, I, 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 I hope that, that that causes a light bulb moment for a lot of people out there just with the kind of time that we're talking about here to actually master what you're passionate about. Yeah, it's repetition. I mean, uh, it, all it is is repetition. It's, um, you know, I mean, there's the 10,000 hour rule. I, don't, I think you may have heard of that. And uh, it's just that don't expect, don't, I, I tell people like, especially when I've helped young kids draw, I'm like, don't, don't think you're going to go hang that on your wall. That, that, that drawing is getting you somewhere. I mean, I've got, I, because we're moving, I just discovered all these terrible drawings and paintings that I was constructing in 1992 and it's embarrassing I was just trying so hard and all I needed it's the you know brush mileage uh for me to be a great painter I think I just have to paint all the time and I just have to paint all the time for like five six ten years just every day that's all I do uh and so it's like it's okay I'm not, I'm not going to, I mean, I love painting. I really, really love painting, but I haven't painted as much as I've drawn. So I'm not staying away from painting just because I'm not as good at it. I'm, I'm like, I'm not worried about it. I'm just like, I'm just creating how I want to create and it doesn't matter. And I love painting, but I'm saying, you know, this whole, you need brush mileage. You need, you need, you need, you need, you just need to work out mediocrity. Mediocrity is like a snotty little brat chasing you around. You just got to like knock him, knock him away. He's just snotty. 
you know, and, and you'll get through it. It just takes time. The, would you would you consider yourself a, a disciplined person? Do you think it requires discipline to do what you do and put in the type of hours that we're talking about here in order to build up that that mileage? Well, yeah, I mean, it goes without saying uh, discipline. Di but di discipline when you love something isn't really like you're not gritting your teeth. You, you, you just can't stop doing it. It's like um, I've said basically on Instagram jokingly in the last few posts, like I can't, I, I'm addicted to drawing. I, I've given myself over to drawing. Uh, it's like uh, discipline is, it's not a task. Discipline is, 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 an, is, a, is a joy um, because you love it. Like I don't love lifting weights. I don't dream about lifting weights. I, I have done it. You can't tell, but it's like, um, I don't dream about lifting weights. I don't dream about running. I don't, you know, uh, I dream about being awesome and drawing. Like I, I, I have to keep myself out of my studio. Like, so I'm saying the whole, di you have to be disciplined, but anybody who's great at something or gets really good is disciplined. But that, that's a, to me, that's a byproduct. It's not like I must be disciplined now. I'm going to go down to my studio to be disciplined. I need discipline today. No, I don't need discipline. I don't even pay attention to discipline. I just can't stop drawing. Yeah. Does that yeah. make sense? Of course, 100%. And so <laughs> it's like nobody had to tell me to, to, to draw. I actually am crying because I'm not able to be drawing right now because I got to pack up my house. I got to go mow my lawn because tomorrow morning they're taking pictures. I'm saying, but I'm hurting. I'm like, oh my gosh, wow. I need to create. I need yeah. to create. Well, again, I just really appreciate this time that you've given to me right now. Um, and and I, because I know what it's like to move, having moved so many times and, and uprooted and set up studios all over the place. And I'm, I'm just glad that now finally I'm not, I'm not leaving this place. <laughs> I'm going to stay here for a while. Awesome. That is awesome. You know, it's, it's, um, you mentioned something there. Um, the, about exercise, I find that having some sort of physical routine, having something that kind of a, engages my body and and just allows my mind a chance to just stop and switch off and focus on something else. This has got enormous tangible benefits on my artistic career. Have you found the same? Are you keeping up with a regular exercise now? Yeah. So so it's interesting. So um, I I. Uh... I, I do exercise, not, not for the last year and a half, two years probably. Um, but exercise is something I've just always done. My wife used to jog all kinds of stuff and, you know, you know, she did try triathlons and stuff. But for me, I played squash and racquetball intensely. I'm an intense person. I get on a, a racquetball court and I'm diving and I'm like 56 and I'm diving all over the place. It's just, we, we play intensely. So I'm intense when I do sports as well i played you know baseball and then i had to stop playing that you know because it's just i'm getting older i hate to play that card but i got you know just too just too much like my body's breaking down but i need to get when we move i'm going to start playing racquetball again and um i play competitively i mean i, I you know i mean i there's there's different levels of racquetball i got to a very weak low open player so there's like you know these different levels and you know a open those are those are solid levels like you've been playing the game for a while and you play at a certain level i i love that but i i, I haven't played racquetball in probably five years i started playing squash so all that to say is it helps me a lot when i'm when i'm working out and 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 i have a spring in my step mentally i'm clear but i need to get back to it mm. Mm. I, I just started playing squash uh, here in, in the little town where I live in, in the South Island, New Zealand, and there's a there's a whole squad of really amazing players. So uh, it's it's good fun. It's pretty intense. But um, now I'm starting with more and more weights as well. I just find that it just it's just the perfect way to just hit that reset button at the end of the day, and then it fuels the next day. But what what I what I found with the exercise, and I've said this before on the podcast, is that. For me, it's almost like a perfect metaphor in, you know, maybe I'm a little bit different in that respect, but it's a, it's a perfect metaphor because I, I, I say to myself, well, look, if physically, if physically I can do this with my body, or at least I try 
to do this, then what's stopping me from doing this, that, or the other in terms of my art, my business, or, or putting myself on the line? Because physically I'm able to do it. And I just find it builds that mental muscle to make that decision to just, to just jump into something, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, okay. So I don't know how old you are. 36. But, um, uh, yeah. Okay. That's awesome. So I got you by 20 years. So, uh, as I, you know, as I, I look at a chunk of time, I'm like, wow, that was 30 years. Oh my gosh, that was 30 years. What? And, you know, I'm saying 30 years from now for me, I'm 86. Like, oh my gosh. Uh, that, you know, I mean, that, that, that's how I, I can look at the last 30 and now I get 30 more. And that last 30 was really fast. Now I'm like, 30 is like that. So I'm, I'm realizing the importance that I need to take care of myself because I honestly want to just keep creating. And, and, um, physically taking care of yourself is key. You know, like, like Bobby Chu is hilarious. Uh, we, we were eating lunch some at somewhere and, and, and he ordered hot water and I was like, why are you ordering hot water? And he said his grandma, his grandmother drinks hot water every day. And she lived to be like a hundred and I don't know, three or four. So he wants to live to be a hundred something and just creating, you know, so it makes sense. I mean, who knows, who knows what you would create? Uh, I mean, my goodness. I mean, what will my artwork look like in 10 years? What will your artwork look like in 10 years? I mean, honestly, if you look at the artwork I did at 36 to 56, it sucked. And it was at a level not to be, not to be lame, but it was, it was at a level, but looking back, I'm like, man, so, you know, Andrew, you throw 20 years on yourself with like really applying and being aggressive and being disciplined. You're going to be even more of a beast. Um, and, you know, I mean, I would throw in for everyone to study with great artists. Don't think you can do this on your own because you can't. Uh, great. Uh, uh, look, uh, Bougaro handed down what he knew. Uh, Sargent had a teacher. And, you know, all these guys, they learned from great artists. When I studied and, you know, went to study with Joe for the last two years consistently, uh, I mean, I'm not the same artist and I'm thinking about things that I never thought of. So this whole idea of, of, of you might have a long life, take care of yourself, but study with great artists because you need to humble yourself and say, teach me, tell me, I need, I need, I want to, I want to be awesome. That's what Bobby Chu does as well. That's what schoolism is all about. You know, sorry for a plug there, but schoolism is all about these great artists that are just like available. And, and I, I just, I try to study with as many great people as I can, cause I want to get great. Well, why don't you talk to us a little bit about schoolism? Why don't we, that's a perfect opportunity to bring this into the podcast. And, and why don't you tell us what that's all about? So you, you teach with us with this, is it, is it a group or a website? Yeah, so schoolism is an online school. Schoolism is just, you know, school, I-S-M, schoolism.com. I always say schoolism is spelled wrong. It should be titled, it should be titled coolism because it's so stinking cool. Like schoolism is awesome because it's like all the, all the top uh, artists, uh, in, in, uh, I'm not trying to put myself in this category, forgive me, but I'm saying that the, the top artists in the world teach there, uh, you, you know, uh, Nathan Fox is, is brilliant. Um, um, all these artists, uh, uh, Alex Wu from Pixar, DreamWorks, um, uh, Alex Blasik is an amazing sculptor. All these dudes who are rock stars uh, have these classes and you can subscribe for like $30 a month and watch all of them. And it's insane. Uh, uh, Dice, uh, it's, uh, I think it's uh, Susumi. Uh, he he and uh, Robert Kondo have classes. There. These guys are incredible artists. He's work at Pixar. Um, insane. And, we, and th we've created these classes. You you can subscribe and watch them for uh, $30 a month, all of them. And, uh, and so that's one way to, to soak in the information and learn all these different classes from digital art, sculpting, uh, color theory, um, figure drawing, all this stuff. I teach drawing and painting. So one of my classes is the fundamentals of, of drawing. And that's a, that's a good in entry level of like, I get people saying, you know what I drew ever since I was a kid, but I never had any formal training. This is five weeks of like the fundamentals. And um, then I have a drawing and I have a painting class with uh, Dutch Flemish. If you want to learn how to paint Dutch Flemish, you can watch the videos. If you want in personal critiques, 
then that's uh, that's like a grand. But you're using a grand in an amazing way. You're studying with someone who you know. You, if you go to art school, I mean, you know, you're gonna you're gonna spend a ton of money. But this is personalized, and so basically how it works is I've I've, I've recorded uh, five uh, five or six weeks of of these different phases of painting, and you 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 pay for the class, you watch the class, the video, the first week, and it's on drawing or whatever, and then you do the homework assignment. You send it back to me. I pop it open. I record it on my screen. I send it back to the to the uh, to the person, and I advance them on to the next class. So that the next one is the underpainting. They 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 watch that one. Uh, they do the homework. Send it to me. I pop it open. I critique and record and talk to them. I send it back to them. I advance them on to the next Fantastic. one. We work all the way through. Great idea. And they 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 send me. Uh, it's like you're one on one in my studio. And it's personalized care uh, information recording over with Camtasia. I send it back to you and we watch and, and we interact. I interact with you for five, six weeks. Some of them are 12 weeks. Um, there's character design. It's insane. It is so cool. And, um, you know, it is, it is, uh, it is, I think it's the premier um, art instruction uh, only because of the artists involved. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm starstruck with these artists as well. They're, they're amazing. So look, if you, like I said, if you want to learn, I wasn't trying to work the conversation towards school. No, I love that. It please. Was just a, You're welcome. Yeah, yeah, please. I was just, I didn't mean it as a plug, but I'm just simply, it goes into the idea of wherever you are. I tell people, wherever you live, try to find out who the great artists are. Go study with them. Go, go plein air paint, go learn how to plein air paint. Um, study with great artists, uh, no matter what your skill sets are, no matter how long you've been doing it, uh, uh, do anything you can to learn something every new, uh, every day. I'm reading this Disney book. Um, I don't have it with me. Uh, this Disney animator wrote it and I said, you know what, as opposed to, uh, you know, uh, sitting on the toilet, looking at Facebook or Instagram, I'm going to actually read this book, uh, every time I use about it, <laughs> I'm gonna say it you know, Whatever. I'm, I'm going to use my time. Yeah. I'm not going to eat my lunch and just look at stupid Instagram. I'm going to I'm going to read this book. And so uh, I just sat down and just for, you know, two minutes, uh, I picked up something extremely valuable. He said, when you draw a figure standing there leaning on a bench, don't draw a figure leaning on a bench, draw a verb. Don't draw a noun, draw a verb. I was like, that's insane. And I, I just I read for literally three minutes and I learned something intensely in three minutes. So it's like using my time, extremely valuable. You know what I mean? That's awesome. It, it's it's really fantastic, you know, because I, again, I have a lot of people reaching out to me who are asking about studying art and wanting to go to some sort of institution, some sort of tertiary education or uh, an atelier or something. Um, I, I try to avoid the university system. I think if you want to learn real tangible skills, there are so many options out there. And really, when, when you look at it, there, there's actually never been a better time to be an artist, in, in my opinion. I just feel like there's so many opportunities that we have, not only to learn, but also in terms of being able to go into a profession using our art. If we're not going down the, the fine art route, at least we can actually have our work you know, do something like, you know, feature as concept art in a movie or, or, you know, work in some sort of advertising or, or, you know, like magazines, like what you, what you've done throughout your career, in addition to the fine art stuff, I just think this is an unbelievably exciting time and a real time for optimism. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so I, I kind of put it this way. Um, so my daughters are, uh, basically they're all artists. I have five daughters, uh, one one we adopted from Russia, um, and she's not an artist, but the other ones are. So one one has a five hundred one c three called Anchor of Hope in Bolivia, where she's uh, ministers to these street kids. So, but she played music, and my other daughters, uh, uh, my other daughters are. Um, all, all, all artists. One of them, um, one's a sculptor, really amazing sculptor, uh, Madeline Lively Fluharty. She's amazing. Uh, she's young. She's like 24 or five. Uh, my other daughter, uh, Stevie, uh, she's, uh, learning, uh, she's going, uh, music. She's a musician 
and she's uh, going to be a music teacher. And my other daughter, Lindsay, is a, uh, a designer. So I, I had this, uh, uh, and that's their job. So um, I had this dilemma, you know, like, uh, do I spend like $250,000 a person for, for their uh, education? I don't have $250,000 for one. So it's like, you have to figure out, like, um, what's the best way to do this, you know? And so, you know, uh, there's, there's local universities, there's community colleges that are cheaper. Uh, you could get into art that way. Um, but I always say this, if you're going to be a designer, if you're going to be a designer, you might have to go get, go to a university and learn design because you can get a staff position as a designer. That makes sense. You're going to get a staff position. If you're going to be an illustrator, that ain't going to happen probably unless you get into like film or you do something in like, uh, you know, uh, in one of the uh, animation schools. Uh, Sheridan is a big air animation school up in uh, uh, Canada. Um, but I'm saying that if you're going to get uh, into animation and start working at some studios, it might m make sense to learn that and go to uh to uh, you know these animation schools, that makes sense. You might owe two hundred fifty thousand, but you might get out of there and you might be able to make that back. You know, be depending on how great you are. So I'm saying there are there there are, there are, there's wiggle room. My whole thing is I had I had a guy come here and he's a beast. This guy, uh, his name's Todd Casey. He's a great painter. He's on Instagram. He's really blowing up. And uh, he came here to visit me like, I don't even know, 15 years ago. And he was an illustrator. He's doing some caricature. And he's like, what do you think? And I said, you know what, Todd, you know, you, I, your work is forgettable in the sense that all, all these people are doing caricature. I don't think you should do caricature. I was like, I don't think I said your work is forgettable because that's a, that's that's not a that's not a helpful phrase. Um, I might I might have said something like, I wouldn't encourage you to get into caricature because it's just not something that I think has a real big future to it. I said, but what you might want to do is, I said, my advice to you is, you know, if, if I think it was graduating, I said, go study with someone great. Go study with uh, an atelier somewhere. Just go study. And that's what he did. He went to study with Jacob Collins in, in New York City. And he studied for like four or five years and he still works at uh, uh, Polo with Ralph Lauren. And uh, now he's doing just these amazing still lifes. He's incredible. And uh, it's blowing up for him because it's solid. He developed solidly as an artist. So all that to say, yeah, you can go to art school and pay, you know, $300,000. But at the end of the day, what you really want, and if you're going to get a staff job, go for it. That's fine. But if, if you can't, try to develop a, a, and study with great people because at the end of the day, you just have to be awesome. That's what you have to be. That's it. You know? Yeah. Absolutely. I, I would really love to ask you about your art and, and really spend a bit of time just focusing on that because, again, I, I'm, I'm blown away by your work. There's a freedom to it, but at the same time, there's, there's like this exacting quality to it as well. When you're doing a caricature of someone, you know, it, it, it just, you, you nail it. My, one of my favorites that I saw on your website, because um, I'm a big Princess Bride fan, um, there's uh, Inigo Montoya right there. And as, as soon as I it just transported me back to my, my childhood, but you've got so many different things on there from your, your mad, mad world of dogs, the sharks, the caricature, the, the pop culture and the superheroes and all this stuff. What, what inspires you to, to create when you're about to make a drawing, what's the trigger for you? What's the thing that causes you to go, ah, I've, I've got to make that. Right, right, right. No, that's a great question, Andrew. I, I'm still trying to figure that out. Um, like I just did a drawing of uh, this guy Lee Rocker with uh, the Stray Cats. And last thing I was going to do was draw Lee Rocker in the morning. Uh, but uh, I, I can't remember how I stumbled upon the Stray Cats. I might follow them on Instagram. I'm not sure, but all of a sudden... I was on the stray. I like the stray cats a lot. I listened to them in the eighties and, um, all of a sudden I just saw this really cool photo of Lee rocker playing his bass, you know? And I was like, dang, that's awesome. That thing, that thing just gripped me. And I was like, 
I shot a screen snap of and I said, when I get a chance to draw, I'm going to draw that in the morning as a warm up. I'm just, I just want to freaking draw that thing. And I just wanted to work out some things. I wanted to play and experiment and draw wonky uh, because I'm drawing Star Wonk right now, which is Star Wars. And, uh, and that happened because a friend of mine sent me his, his Luke Skywalker, uh, Glenn Ferguson, uh, who's really a great caricaturist. Sent, he's a friend of mine, um, Glenn Ferguson. He sent me uh, this sketch of Luke Skywalker. And I was like, oh, my gosh, that, that's freaking awesome. And it just made me like, wow, that's cool. And so I, uh, you know, I, I shot a screen snap of it and I said, dang, I really want to draw that photo that he drew from. But I was like, I can't do that because I would be stealing his thunder, you know, like, and then if I posted it, cause he didn't post it, it would have been unethically not cool, but it fired me up. And then I was like, I saw the idea that like, there's a whole world there with star Wars. And so I just started gathering all this reference. I started studying Star Wars and I just gathered these few images and said, I just want to draw this. I want to draw Star Wars wonking it out. So because because he had fired me up, I start I did this one drawing of all of Princess Leia, Luke, Han Solo, and Chewbacca. And I just composed them. I took two photos and combine them together. The one thing I don't want to do is just copy a photo. I want to like make it say something. So I combined two of them together, but I kind of wonked it out and said, this is funky. This is wonky. And uh, I absolutely, I was just not really trying. I was just like, screw it. If I mess up, it doesn't matter. And I put it on this 11 by 17 piece of paper. And there's these intensities that I have to do. I have to make sure the whole drawing fits. And as I draw Luke, then I've got to leave room. I've got to design it all because it's only eight and a half by 11, eight, it's 11 by 17. And there's no erasing because you can't erase. Uh, this, pe this, this pencil doesn't erase. And I'm like, this is nuts. And I, uh, I was like, does that really look like her? And I was like, I don't care. And I just like created this drawing. And I was like, this is awesome. This thing is freaking cool. And then I posted it and it freaking like connected. And people like went nuts over it. And I was like, I'm on to something. And, but I loved it at the same time. So I wasn't just trying to do this to get people to like it, but Ian McKay, who's, um, a, he designed all these characters for Star Wars and worked on all these Star Wars. He actually shared it. So that was like a huge validation. Like, wow, if he shared it, that's cool. Um, and then it just became this idea that like there's more here and so i i just basically you know like with anigo montoya he's like i committed my life to finding the fix the six finger man it's like i committed my life <laughs> the last months to drawing star wonk because it just has gripped me and so it's like uh, i've committed the last number of months and i want to commit more to it because i'm not done with it and so it's like that idea of if I'm gripped by it, I'm not going to let it go until I feel like, no, number one, I can't sell it. Or number two, it's, it's just, it's just, it's not, there's not enough there for me. So I'm still drawing dogs, but right now I'm sort of off of dogs for right now. And there are reasons why I'm not drawing dogs, but I'm, I'm on to uh, just continuing to draw. And now I'm, I'm doing the Star Wong stuff. And the whole point is this. It always has to have a reason. It always has to, number one, be able to sell it. That's number one, honestly. It has to be something that connects a nerve. But it also it touches a nerve. But I also got to have a little bit of an understanding of it. And I do like Star Wars. I'm not a Star Wars geek. But I love dogs. I love sharks. I love everything I've been drawing. So it's, there's always this love connected to it. It's a passion connected to it. So when you infuse it with love, it's going to say, someone's going to look at it and say, wow, there's something about that. If I draw, let's say if I draw a, a bug or a cat, I don't love cats. People are, it, they won't resonate. But there's something infused in what you love that you do that, people will, it will resonate. 
So right now I'm drawing Star Wonk because number one, I want to sell them and I want to approach some galleries. I want to uh, go to Star. Uh, I want to. I want to go to um, um, a Comic Con. I want to go back to Comic Con. I want to uh, uh, st- approach the Star Wars celebration and get a booth at 2020 and and just set up a a show. So I'm just going to keep creating Star Wonk until. Um, I mean, but I'm already selling them. That's the other thing. People have written me and said, "Hey, I, I love this Star Wonk stuff you're doing. What do you have for sale?" And I'm like, well, this one isn't for sale, but this are. And, and I just sold three drawings and sent them to Portland. So I'm just saying, it's cool. It's like, this is so freaking cool. And, you know, like I got this one Yoda right here that I haven't finished. Oh, and it's what a like, treat. Hold, that, hold that up to the camera. Cool. Come, on, come on, hold that up. It's, it's cool. Look at this. Okay, you know I'll just I mean? mention so like, um, I'll just mention to the people listening to the audio version of this podcast. If you want to see the video version, jump onto my YouTube channel, and you're going to see a real treat. This is Yoda. Oh my goodness! I'm working on that one, and and um, I just have all these other things that are going on that I'm just I'm just you know what I mean? Like it's crazy. I mean, it's really crazy. I got, yeah, I've got a lot of stuff here that's just, oh, I'm still, one I'm more. just. One more. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, this one's actually really cool. This is not done yet. Oh, I love but it. This, this one is, this one is insane. I got to get in and move a few things around, but I'm going to actually paint this sucker. But I got something oh, else. This one is really it. cool too. Hold that on. is unbelievable. This one's really cool too. This one's really cool. This is uh, Han Solo. Han Solo. Uh, you can see the size of it, but. <laughs> I do these drawings up to this level and then I just step away and get distracted and start drawing something else. But these are cool, you know, like Mm. I'm going to actually finish these suckers. And, um, but I got, I got a few others here that are really crazy. Oh man, this one's insane. This one's really cool. So this one was, this is one that I'm going to do. Um, it's Darth Maul and I'm going to put three figures down here. But it's really cool, you know. Like, look at that. It's just yeah. crazy. <laughs> yeah. So I, I don't know. I'm, I'm like going off. But wait, I got one more. Oh, this one's really cool, but I haven't finished it yet. This is the one where they're in the actual. Um, oh, I love it in the Millennium yeah. Falcon. Yeah. <laughs> but they're kind of wonked out. Chewie looks a little funky. You know, but these, this, yeah, this is just, it's but again, you've, it's you've Star nailed Wars. them, it's but like, this is the thing. Like, you, know? you have, Thomas, yeah. you have this ability of being able to distill the character. Thanks, man. And, and you just, it, forgive me, but it doesn't look like that drawing took very much time. But I think that's the skill where you actually, oh, well, okay, look, it took decades of experience, sure. But in actual time of sitting there with your, your pencil or the, the um, I'll have to ask more about the materials you use, but it just looks like it, the, the character is just there. It's 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 infused with that that vital essence of of the character, and there's this immediate recognition with me just seeing the profile of Harrison Ford as Han Solo and, and a couple of drawings back. It, just a quick little study, and you nail it. I'm just like that blows me away. That pushes my buttons, man. That's really oh, cool. that's awesome, man. Well, thank you. I, I mean, I, I have them where I miss as well. I mean, here's one that here's one that I just did that's not completely nailed down. You know, this is Luke. So I'll do these drawings. You know, and 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 a lot of times the eyes is everything. If you if you're off in the eyes, you're off. It, it, you could if you're on the eyes, you could put that freaking eyes on a dog, and it's like, wow, those that dog looks like Luke Skywalker, <laughs> because the eyes are everything. Yeah. You know, the eyes are it. And so because I'm. I mean, I, thankfully, I have more uh, hits than I do misses, but I have misses and I just, I don't worry about it. And, um, and sometimes, sometimes the misses are uh, where it just didn't work, you know, like, it, it's like, but a lot of times there's no erasing. I can't, this is what it is. It is what it is. It's like, there's no, you have to chart this out. It's crazy. It's a crazy discipline, but no, it's, it's cool, man. I mean, I, I enjoy it. And, that's the stuff that fires me up, you know? I love what you said a little while back about infusing it with love. And you it's causing me to think about something and really challenge something as well. I was told in art school and university, which I will say, personally, I feel did more harm than good for me. Again, it was not a skills-based education system. It was more teaching you what to think, not how to think. And um, I... I um, 
I heard there that if you sell your work, um, you're not a real artist. If you're commercial, then you're selling out. And I love what you were saying there about infusing this thing with love, but you seem so excited to actually make the sale and connect that with somebody. I love that. So how do you maintain personally your authenticity and your, your personal integrity and at the same time have a healthy commercial art business? Okay, yeah, that's a great question. So anybody say, making stupid statements like that is literally stupid. And usually they're not the ones selling their work. Those are the ones that, they're, I mean, look, you talk to anybody great and, and people want to buy their work, they're selling their work. Um, Bougaro, for example, I just saw a Bougaro show. So Bougaro said, Bougaro is a businessman. And he said, and I mean, he's one of the greatest artists in the history of the world hands down painting and drawing um, it's just it's not even debatable he said i found out that when i draw um gory ghosts those don't sell as much as nymphs and angels so i need to draw more nymphs and angels that's what he said meaning oh you're selling out no no i'm not i'm making a million dollars that's what I'm doing. And I'm doing what I absolutely love. So he literally did. He made tons of money and he, and that was financial freedom for him. But he also knew, he knew what he needed to do and he could, and he could do anything he wanted. But, um, I'm not, I'm not drawing kitties in boots, uh, and selling them for $10,000 and looking the other way. Uh, I think I would go nuts if I if I was drawing uh, kitty kitties in boots, you know, it, it, it would just I would die because that's not me. But if I can wonk something out and I can do caricature, which I absolutely love, it's always a challenge. It always keeps me excited. I'm always pressing in. So this whole idea of selling out is ridiculous. It's like, um, uh, you know, I want people to own my work. I want to be able to do, I don't, I want to be able to not have to go get a real job. And so that's, that's what I'm doing. It's like, sometimes my wife's like, you have any work on your table today? I'm like, yeah, I got a ton of work on my table. You got any paying work? Absolutely. And it's just like, well, that doesn't mean I'm making money today, but I'm going to sell this thing. And I used to do storyboards and it used to be like, uh, I'd make money, uh, you know, every couple of days. I don't have to make money every day because I'm teaching on schoolism, but I'm also selling my work. I'm also selling, I'm creating stuff and I'm selling it. You know, I'm, I'm, um, there's a lot of ways I make money. I diversify my skill. I don't just make do one thing. Uh, and that's, that's a real problem. If someone is only going to sell kitties in boots, that's nuts. You know, uh, you know, just one thing, if you just do storyboards and that's where you park yourself, when storyboards goes away, you're toast. So it's like, I'm, I'm diversifying. I'm, I'm creating. I mean, I got books that I'm going to create in 2020 and then I'm going to take them and sell them. I'm going to put them on my website, but I'm also going to go to some shows and I'm going to sell them. So I'm saying I'm always creating, I'm always thinking, and it's just, it's the things that I love to do, you know? Hmm. Uh, brilliant. I, I love that word diversification. I think as artists today, we don't, we don't take that into account enough. And I think this is, again, a really good time to be diversifying because there's so many different ways you can monetize your art. I, I learned that lesson the hard way, uh, unfortunately, um, with you know, a little wobble in the marketplace. I was in the fine art world selling my work uh, through a, a gallery and an agent. And I also had some private commissions that I was working through. But with a little bit of a dip in the market, something going on there, what ended up happening? I lost my business. I, I totally lost my business. So what I, what I do now, I, you know, I, I think of it, I think of it like a tabletop, right? So you, you got your tabletop is your, is your creative production and, and, and being able to sustain a particular lifestyle and the leg under the table, holding that table up is your revenue stream. And if you got just one revenue stream coming in from one source and somebody comes and kicks that table leg out from under your table, you're done. And so if you got a couple under there, hey, you're doing better. And now I've got about five or six operating there. So if one goes, no big deal. No big deal. So I love the diversification. I think it's, I think it's vital. Yeah, I, th that's what uh, Thomas Luharty's Mad Mad World of Dogs is. That's one, that's one way I make money. Um, you know, um, the Star Wonk is another, is another venture. 
uh, selling originals, just creating every day. That's another venture. Creating my books and prints, putting them up, making them available. People want to own my work. They want to. They want to buy my books. I'm gonna. I'm. I'm basically. In the, and so I'm mean, saying that's another. That's another uh, way that I diversify. I teach at schoolism. I diversify. I, I love teaching. I'm doing workshops right now. Um, I'm. I'm just started. I'm going to be having a bunch of workshops in 2020. I did three this year. Um, that's diversification. It's not. It's not. Um, it's not wrong to diversify. It's extremely smart. I mean, everyone, I, you should be, if you, if you work at Pixar and that's all you have, they could fire you. I know someone that worked there and they let him go. So, I mean, but he has all the skill sets and he can go do anything now, but I'm saying diversification is gigantic. And, you know, it just, it just takes some time to think it through, you know, like how can, what are the ways I can make money so that I don't have to go get a real job? It's my hope that somewhere out there, somebody, you know, maybe that's 10 or 12 is going to hear what you're saying right now. And the light bulb's just going to go off for them. And it's just going to be like, man, I, I can, I can do that. I can really do that. And, and hear about what it takes as well. It's interesting. You know, when we're talking about diversification, and talking about making this work as a business, you're not only an artist, you, you almost have to be an entrepreneur. Well, yeah, that's exactly what I am. And so I, I study entrepreneurs. I, I follow entrepreneurs. I, f I follow millionaires because I want to know how they think. I, I, I'm trying to use my time wisely. I mean, I'm follow, I follow entrepreneurs all the time. I, I read Seth Godin's books. Seth Godin is genius. Fantastic, yeah. Uh, he has a book called Purple Cow. Purple Cow is fantastic. It helped me to think. It, it, it taught me how to think. I've, I've listened to numerous books. I need to get back to it, you know. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I'm aggressively planning. Like, I need to think. I need to, I need to be an entrepreneur. I need to study business. So I just listen. I'm start, I need to get back to that this year. So I'm, I'm doing that right now. So, so I, I don't know about you, Thomas, but when I'm drawing and painting in the studio, I find that my, my mind, my conscious mental space is not taken up with thinking about doing the drawing or the painting that my mind is actually free so i find that in the studio while i'm creating i'm listening to things like audio books and, and audio programs yeah. and i i think i'm yeah. I think we're incredibly lucky to have this thing, you know, Tony Robbins refers to this as net time or no extra time. So you can double up your life basically. Right. So you can be studying full time yeah. and producing work full time. Yeah. So are you, That's are you right. listening to audio stuff while you work? Yeah, I am. I actually am. <clears throat> it's interesting. So I listen to a ton of music uh, and I listen to Spotify, you know, a lot. Spotify is like constant. And then lately, I've been listening to Jocko Willink. Willink. Jocko oh, is a yeah. Jocko, Jocko's a Navy SEAL, and uh, again, it's it's this. Uh, I used to think Navy SEALs were like these testosterone supermen, and I've been a huge geek out fan fanboy of these Navy SEALs. I've watched everything and watched YouTube videos, but listening to Jocko, you realize like they're actually human beings, and they're actually cool people, and they're really real. And there's another dude, Jason Gardner, who's um, uh, he and his wife, Iris, uh, just the rock stars. They have these stories and they're just they're real people, but they're 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 real. And you start being inspired by just th their humanity, you know, that they're not just testosterone. They're really real people and they have lives and they've been broken and they've worked through it. And so that's what I mean. I listen. I listen. I've been listening to Jocko a lot in, in terms of like just uh, being inspired by people who are inspiring. You know what I mean? Uh, because uh, life is dark. I mean, there's a lot of darkness in the world. And I don't read the news. I hate the news. Uh, I try not to swipe left on my phone uh, and read the latest news. It sucks. And so I try to just keep, I, I try to keep my life and my mind uh, where it's just filled with um, truth and just just don't get involved in in politics and the nonsense and 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 the and the suckiness of life of facebook and stuff like that you know where it's like it's like life is short and i want to be inspired and i want to be excited and i think i i'm usually excited and and if i create i feel like if i have joy 
um, if I if I have joy and I create from joy, that joy will be infused in what I'm creating, and it will resonate. People will look at it and they'll say, "Wow!" And so to create in joy is is a matter of disengaging a lot of time from social media. But but when I say social media, Instagram has a place because it inspires me. There there's a lot of amazing artists. But what I've what I've come to do is not to get depressed and discouraged. And and always when I'm discouraged, it's because I've just compared myself. So I'm aware, oh, I got discouraged just because I compared myself. So once I once I'm aware of discouragement, it's because I compared myself. I stop comparing myself and then I remind myself Bougaro's in the basement and then I move on. Brilliant. And that just that brings you brings you back to center again, doesn't it? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, you know, there's this thing, you know, with Jocko Willink. He's got this little video that I, I I keep thinking about. It's called, I think it's just called Good, and it's him yeah. giving his his philosophy yeah. about, oh, yeah. you know, your girlfriend yeah. dumped you. Good, you <laughs> good. lost your job. You good. didn't get the promotion. You get the, yeah, good. good. Yeah. As a yeah. way, you know, you want to try stop being chocolate cake. Good. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Because <laughs> the the thing that it causes you yeah. to do that kind of philosophy is it reprograms and reframes your brain to actually focus on those negative things that come up in your life and your career as as a positive benefit. The amount of people I get messaging me that are discouraged and depressed about where they are with their work. Sometimes I wanna send them that little Jocko Willink video, but I, I I don't think it would land quite right if they weren't ready to hear it. But I think that there's sometimes, there's something nice about being at square one. There's something nice about having this journey in front of you, about being able to go, you know what? I can see that there are steps in front of me. This is just where I'm at right now. And my feeling right now is just a feeling and all I need to do is just get past this and just bite off the next chunk and and just start pro progressing in that way. And again, what I hope people will be able to hear from hearing your story as well is that you you started somewhere. And so when when you look on your Instagram feed or your your impressive body of work, that didn't just happen. This is something that it was born out of just decades of of hard graft it's years it's totally years like i was saying to somebody that if instagram came around like 15 years ago I, um i'm glad it didn't because right now i i've been on maybe four years i think maybe and the cool thing about it it's like i have worked through all of this mediocrity to finally be at a place where if I'm creating something that's cool and if it happens to inspire someone, it's because there's all these years that have gone into it. It's literally 35 years I've been drawing every single day for 35 years. And it's like, it's just so crazy to think about how fast it's gone. And especially with the extreme focus in the last three years, I think, uh, it's just like somebody said, man, you're so prolific. I was like, I don't even know what prolific means. Wow. You know, I had to like look it up. I was like, what the heck is prolific? And it's just like, you're just freaking making work all the time. Like Sting is prolific, you know? Uh, he's just creating. And another cool thing about Sting is like, he um, he's creating and he's not looking on social media to see how many people liked his work or liked his latest oh. song. He's on, the, he's on the doing the next, the next album with Shaggy. And then after Shaggy, he's doing something with Dominic. You know, yeah, it's like he's yeah. not he's not seeing how many people like this little ponytail as he sang on a, on a, sitting on a wall as a silhouette. He did that. And I don't know what, what what year it was. It was a, a piece of my heart or something. And it was just like, duh. But it's like he's just creating. He's just creating and he's just creating. And it's just like and it's like somebody said I was just reading this book on Disney uh, by this Disney animator. And he said. What's awesome is that the more you create, the more creative you become. And it's like this fuel. It's like this life. It, it, you don't, you don't, you don't, uh, you don't um, diminish. You actually replenish your creativity. You, you create more and you become more on fire. 
And so that's that's mainly what I'm experiencing. I mean, like I said, I've got this drawing that I, I want to freaking finish. But like I went on to another one because I'm just like, whoa. And it's like this this it's this creative fire that happens. And so that that's what I'm getting at. That's, that's how we kind of got into this whole thing. It's just this showing up somewhere, showing up on Instagram. Um, it, it, you know, people have to keep into context that this has been going on for a very, very long time. You know, even if somebody's only on social media for uh, four years or whatever, or on, or, or especially on Instagram. Steve Houston is a great idea. It's great oh, example. An he's an amazing he's artist. An incredible he's an amazing artist. artist and he's, and he's helpful and he's, um, he's life giving. And so it's like, when he does that, this dude's freaking been around for a long time. I remember walking in a gallery in Soho in like, um, I don't even know. Uh, I was in New York. I lived there for a long time. And all of a sudden I walk in this gallery, there's Steve Houston. He's doing the same work, but he's still freaking awesome. He's as awesome as he was then. And it's just like, he's even better. But I'm saying my point is he's just prolific. He's just creating. And he's not creating to, to, so that somebody notices him. He's just creating. It's like, if everybody was blind, would you create? I would. I would create. If everybody was blind, I don't care. What if you were blind? That's a great question. I don't know. I, I would cry. It would take a while to figure it out. I think it would be a broken place. I think it would be very difficult. I think I think it's sort of like, uh, I, again, this is a, a sort of ridiculous just answer like I know what would happen. But if you ever watch The Incredibles, uh, Bob, did you just ever see The Incredibles? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Love that movie. So Bob Bob Parr Bob Parr goes into hiding and he's a superhero and so he becomes a tax guy and he 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 he's reduced to a cubicle that he shares with a cement pillar in his cubicle and he's crouched over and he's just like he he's monotone all the life is sucked out of him because he's a superhero he's a freaking superhero but he's he's just he's pushing papers. His whole point is he's diminished. He's not, he, so if 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 you if you take away our eyesight, that that would that would be difficult because it's 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 like seeing is 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 who we are. It's like we create. You know that's who we're made to be. You know what I mean? I think it would really hurt. I often think about that. I, I often think you know if I if I suddenly went blind, uh, what would I do? And I think I'd be you know like you in that way it would it would hurt definitely and then i think well what other what other capacity do i have in my brain for other things that are creative i don't know but i don't know what it is but i i do think about that often it's not, i'm in insanely yeah, grateful would you, would you still create i would create i'd probably i'd probably pick i, I would pick up my guitar and I would just, I'd become musical, oh, yeah. you know, and I would, yeah, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'd create, I I'd probably create sculptures that were meant to be felt. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah, there you go. So That's you just cool. open I up. Like that. I like that, yeah. I don't want to go blind though. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, me neither. Me neither. Yeah, because then I wouldn't get yeah. to look at artwork like like the stuff you produce. <laughs> so this, um, it, it's interesting. I, I've, you, you, again, you've got such a, um, a wide variety of work on, on your website, but it, it all seems to be done with immense skill, but also a real sense of humor as well, because you were just mentioning the piece of Hillary Clinton. Now, look, I know you don't want to get political or anything, neither do I, um, but how did that drawing come to be? And can you tell me more about that process? Which you, one are you talking about? Uh, let me pull it up. Is it in your portfolio? What is she, what is she doing? She is reaching with one hand in her jacket, almost like a mason yeah, okay. sign, and the other hand yeah. with a fist. Wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. So that that actually uh, that caused them, that caused some problems, I think. Um, okay, so I don't mean any of this as a brag, but uh, that won a gold medal at Spectrum in Fantastical Art, which is really bizarre. Um, it was just crazy. I didn't even know it. I just submitted it under editorial. Uh, it was an image I saw in my mind uh, for quite some time. She's running for president. She's running for the presidency in 1993. And I just saw Hillary. Uh, it's called Sir Hillary poised for a takeover. And she was running, you know, running for the uh, presidency. And I just saw this image and I just didn't paint it and didn't draw it 
finally, I was just like, man, I got to I got to create this image. And I just put it down and painted it. And and uh, and I was very heavily inspired by uh, Jean, uh, Jean Auguste Dominique uh, Ang. And I was like, oh, my gosh. Uh, and so uh, that's what it was. And then uh, when it when it uh, was submitted to uh, Spectrum, uh, my friend who was on the jury said, Tom, you actually freaking won the gold medal. I was like, no way. And then I found out that uh, uh, some people were really pissed off about it. They were ticked <laughs> off. They they did not want to give me a gold medal. I'll lighten up, uh, they, they hated it. They didn't like it. And and uh, and I heard this from the guy that owns uh, Run Spectrum, Arnie uh, Fenner. He was like, Tom, he's like, I had to say that this was fantastical art, that this was this was uh, summed up who we are. Uh, it's it's uh, it's like uh, it's like, you know, it's it's super fantasy. It's just crazy. So that was huge. That was like gigantic. So uh, I still have it. People people love it. People hate it. And uh, it's probably my most uh, maybe it's the most talked about piece I've done. So yeah. I don't know. And it was actually in acrylics, believe it oh, or not. Wow. Wow. That was the last painting I did in acrylics. The other one that I just love here that I've, I've just pulled up is this one of, of Bill and Hillary uh, on the occasional chair. And uh, you, again, you just nail the character. It's it's impossible to. to I, I don't think it matters particularly what side of the the spectrum you're on. You are left, you are right. You are Republican, you are Democrat. You are fan, you are not. A fan. I don't think it matters. When I look at that painting, it makes me smile. It's hilarious because again, you distill this character, and it's such a sense of humor. Yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah. It's is that the soap opera where uh, she's like this with her fists and going like in a chair. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. So, so that was a, that was a, that was for uh, the Weekly Standard, and uh, I had like a couple of days to paint it. That was in oils, and it was insane. So they were like, "Can you do Bill the Bill and Hillary as a soap opera?" And I was like, "Oh my gosh, I would do that for free." Uh, so I was like, "Yeah." So I had I googled soap opera, and you have to capture that soap opera moment. So. That was that was insane. That was that was a that was a crazy moment. So that was I mean they basically they write it themselves. I just simply uh, made it you know turn it into what it already is. It's it, you're almost a, a, a fly on the wall in terms of culture and society, aren't you? I, I I kind of feel that that artists are are the ones that are sitting back observing, and again distilling all this information from around us and then putting it down. And it's almost doing it without judgment or anything else. Just going, it's just running through that filter and then put back in again. And it's going, here you go. This is you. You know, I, I, yeah. Yeah. It's visual commentary is for sure what it is. Like they're paying you to visually comment. That's what it, that boils down. So you're not visually commenting uh, passively. I'm being mean. I'm being mean to Hillary. I'm being mean to Bill. I'm poking. I'm making fun. I'm making them look dumb. You know, uh, Trump, I'm making him look dumb because I think that he's dumb in any given moment. I think he's done dumb stuff. Uh, Bush, on the other hand, people hate him, people whatever. But I mean, I wasn't trying to make him look stupid. I don't think he's as dumb as people were saying and all whatever. People, you know, people come after these guys. So when I made him into a cowboy, I, I wasn't trying to make him look like an idiot. But I just made, I poked fun at him. So yeah, you know, there are people I take the gloves off for, you know, so it's like, but, but you know what, people do that. That's what, that's what, that's what the job is as a caricaturist. You're going to make, you're going to, you're going to, you're going to, you know, yeah, you're going to go after certain people and that's okay. So how do you draw these political figures and people that are really up there in the society, like, like uh, Hillary or Donald and, and at the same time, keep the news at arm's distance? and not actually focus on that too much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know what you mean. Um, so I don't pay attention to the news. Uh, I'll see little blurbs, but I don't read things. So, uh, mm. you know, um, uh, when I have to do a story or something, I read, I read what I need to know. Most of the time it's like, most of the time it's like, uh, you know, oh, oh, she's, she, you know, I just did uh, Al Sharpton. This was a cover. Uh, I don't know. I can't see my screen anymore. Basically, uh, no, I can. I can see that. I can. Yeah, perfect. Oh, beautiful work. I see Bernie. I see Bernie in the background. Yeah. So it was like Al Sharpton is sitting in a chair arrogantly, 
and you have Bernie, and they give me a lineup of people. So at that point, I design it, and I, I, you know, I make Al looking stupid uh, because he's arrogant. And so I don't really read much, but I gather different photos and work from them. And uh, and yeah, I mean, and, and I that one was painted digitally. I only had like two days on that, and so uh, you know, you basically, I, I, I concern myself with what's absolutely necessary. Just enough to do the story. Absolutely. I will just mention, though, that the cover that you just held up was the cover of the Washington Examiner. And, yeah, um, that's the Washington Examiner. Yeah, uh, it's uh, brilliant work. And again, just as soon as you see it, you know exactly who it is. But there's more of a character of the person coming through. There's this real, there's this quality to your work where it's, you know, it's immediately recognizable, but you immediately understand more about the story, but also the individual characteristics of the people that you're painting. Yeah. And to me, it's like right. it's visual communication at its best. It requires no yeah. verbal explanation whatsoever. You look at it, you get it, and it's immediate. And this is a thing I, I think with with art, we so many so many people today have, have almost lost that in a way. And and I I'm really grateful to people like you for for doing this because I, I think what's become lost is a lot of work nowadays, in particular with contemporary art, it requires so much of a verbal description for the viewer to get. They call it reading the work. Why would you have to read work? Yeah, you know, you right. Know, Exactly. You're supposed to look at it and get it. If it's doing its job, you look at it, you get yeah. it. And 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 right on. this is why I think, you know, what you're doing, and again, I'm not saying this to to just, you know, patronize or anything. I, I just I, I genuinely dig it. You know, you look at it oh, thanks, and you man. get it, man. You get it. No, thanks. Yeah, no, it's um I think I mean see so many people think that like caricature is just like big nose and I'm going to blow it out, you know? Uh, and then they're loud everywhere, but caricature for me, at least my, my work, it's, you know, it's, I'm, I'm picking, I'm picking the places to blow out. So if, and you know, I'm picking the places to tell a story or picking the places to have fun. And so that instant, that instant recognizability about it, or it, it's just, it's just a thing that happens through, uh, you know, that just happens through the years of doing it. You start finding your voice. And so the other thing that I do when I do caricature is uh, I'm always trying to find the greatest photo of that person. Not all of the pictures look like them, but, but sometimes even if I've never seen the person before, I look at all the photos of them. And I say, wow, this one, they keep looking like this. They keep looking. And I start seeing this spirit about them. So Bernie's smile, I'm like, that's Bernie. And so like you said, when you see it, you go, oh, that's Bernie. And it's almost like this uh, innate skill that maybe I have where I'm picking the right reference. I'm picking the right swipe, the right picture that really captures that person. And so I'll look for a, a, an hour to try to find that perfect shot. And I rarely go just Google the person. I'll, I'll grab pictures from Google, but I go to like Getty. I'll go to like these extreme uh, houses that have pictures that nobody has really seen. And I try to draw not from the famous uh, caricature photos, but photos that I've really taken a little time to find. And so it's all those little things that make my work different because I'm doing a little bit of extra work and I'm not just picking a picture that everybody's uh, caricatured before. Everybody's bored with that. They mm. check out on it. Yeah, yeah, you know? absolutely. Trying to find and then, that and then fresh you throw, approach. Yeah, you throw it on a little body and all of a sudden, you know, you got a caricature. Right, right. So you're putting up all of this beautiful work on your Instagram feed. What, what's next for you? What are the projects that are more kind of your, your immediate to short term or maybe even some long term projects? Where, where are you going from here, Thomas? That's cool. That's a great question. Um, I, I was talking to somebody, uh, and I, and he's a really great friend and he's, uh, he run, he's like a, he's a smart man and he's in, you know, he's just, he's, he's someone I ask and I said, what about a five-year plan? He said, I don't, I don't have a five-year plan. And I was like, wow. So, you know, everybody thinks they have a five-year plan. Knowing myself, um, I, don't, I can't tell you I'm going to be excited uh, about drawing uh, um, 
um, centipedes uh, in five years, or if I'll still be drawing star wonk in five years. So I don't know. I don't know. I honestly don't know. All I know is this. I want to be freaking awesome at drawing. I want to understand it. I want to develop and grow and just keep drawing and see where it goes. And so I want to just keep drawing the things that move me because I know they'll move people. So I'm not trying to move people. I'm trying to move me. And so I'm just trying to develop and grow. Like I want to go out and, and, and plein air paint and work out what I've been studying with Joe Paquette. But I, I just don't have time right now. And so um, I'm going to do some paintings of Yoda. I'm going to finish a star, a two Star Wonk uh, full figures that I started. Um, I want to uh, create a body of work to uh, to approach some galleries in L.A. around uh, uh, Star, uh, star Wars celebration in 2020. I want to, uh, you know, I just want to keep creating a body of work. I want to sell my originals. I want to just create stuff like that. That if this guy, I just did, I did a, a maestro series. And so um, the maestro series, I came back and I just did one more. I did a, um, uh, a Miss America uh, series. And out of the blue, I just said, man, I was, I was flipping through that file. I was like, dang, this was really cool. These, these, uh, these Miss Americas I drew. And I'm like, dang, I'm going to do another one. So I just did another one and posted it. And then somebody bought it. And so I'm just having a blast, you know, like I want to keep having a blast. That's my five-year goal. Keep having a blast. Keep being engaged. Keep being excited. Keep loving what I'm doing. And if I get sick of Star Wonk, I'm on to something else. I, I, the, the, I tell you what's amazing is the Wizard of Oz is, the Wizard of Oz is a pretty cool uh, uh, whole genre. Um, wow, also, the Princess me, Bride's yeah. on my, the wow. Princess Bride is on my radar as well. I've been wanting to paint this ultimate uh, um, um, princess bride painting that's like, you know, you know, 30 by 40 and bigger. I want to paint this oh. insane thing uh, of, yeah. of, you know, drawn well, yeah. drawn wonked out, yeah. but where it's just like, oh my gosh. And someone will say like, well, who are you going to sell that to? I don't know until they see it. Right here. That's the whole point. <laughs> you know, like, I can just I, see. I, I, uh, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, I'm not, I, I don't necessarily, I haven't sold this yet, but I'm taking all this stuff with me to Lightbox Expo in, in the next next two weeks. And I'm going to have all my originals there and I'm just going to sell them to people who want my work. I don't have to have a five-year plan, but I'm definitely, I want to just be excited. You know what I mean? Like I started drawing sharks and the whole reason why I stopped drawing sharks is because I couldn't sell them. You know what I mean? I haven't sold them yet, but I will. I actually sold one, but I don't care. I that's what I did for like a month. It doesn't matter, but I still have them. They're going to sell at some point, but I'm I'm not going to sell them for $200. I'm going to sell them for freaking 4,000 or 3,000 or 10,000 or whatever. But you know, I don't have to sell it. Do you see my point? You see what I mean? Like, I don't want to just give it away, but I do have it. And people are inquiring and they're like, oh, dude, that's a little bit out of my budget. That's okay. I have other things that I do. I have drawings that I've been selling of sharks. So that's fine. I'm saying, you know what I mean? I'm just excited. I know you're excited, but I'm not going to lock myself into one thing. You know what I'm saying? For sure. For sure. Absolutely. That's a fantastic, man. I'm on the Princess Bride painting, I can just see the, the ship at the base of the Cliffs of Insanity with the screaming eels. <laughs> You know what that yeah, sound right is, on. Princess? Right yeah, that's right. That's right. The freaking eel. Yeah, 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 that's yeah. Right, man. Shrieking that's right. eels, yeah. Oh, that'd be brilliant. Put it this way. If I do something, it has to have a fanatical fan base. That fanatical fan base is uh, security, meaning you already have a, you have a, you have a market. You have, a, you have people that are hungry. And so you create it they'll want it like i just i no no doubt i just i did an underpainting of obi-wan kenobi and sold it with two he just dude was like man uh, i love your work uh i love the old star star wonk stuff what do you have for sale i, I showed him like five or six things and he bought three things and, and i sent him out to portland and i'm gonna paint another obi-wan you know what i mean like i'm just saying but i'm just saying uh 
original artwork, people will want your stuff. Like, and landscapes are a high percentage. I, I don't put it this way. When I put up, I just haven't done enough of, of landscapes. I got to do it for a long time. But it's all good, you know? It's like, where are you going to spend your time? What's going to get your time? You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. I like... I like asking this question to to the guests on the creative endeavor because it's something that I often think about and I kind of go back and forth of, as to what I would do. But if you had the opportunity to go back in time, sit down with your younger self, maybe right at the cusp of, of some of those things that you were going through, um, maybe around 10, 12, or maybe even a bit older, around 16. If you had the opportunity to go back and talk to yourself as a, as a younger man, what would you say if you would say anything? What would you impart any wisdom? Uh, yeah. Um, I mean, that's a great question. It, it'd be, it'd be, it'd be uh, flippant to answer it so quickly. Um, you know, the, the, you know the, the number one thing I would say in terms of just uh, as a human being is be kind to people, be nice to people. And remember, people are hurting, people are broken. And so to, to reach out and change their day just by acknowledging them and helping them. Um, that, that's, that's to me, that, that is, that's a big deal. Um, and, and don't be arrogant. Don't be arrogant. Be helpful. Be helpful to people, you know, uh, and, and, and love on those around you. Love, love on your wife, love on your, your kids. Nothing's more important than them. Uh, art, art at the end of the day, uh, it can only make you so happy, but it has a ceiling. But your family, your family uh, is legit and your friends are legit. And that, that's everything. You know what I mean? Mic drop. <laughs> drop the mic. <laughs> Uh, yeah, fantastic, fantastic. So, so is that what you would tell? Is that what you tell your your ten year old self? Ten year old self, I'd say, uh, stop being, uh, stop playing kung fu, and uh, acting like you're Bruce Lee, and um, don't do drugs, and uh, and study as hard as you can in school because you could be extremely smart someday if you apply yourself and draw and study and go study with great artists <laughs> and be humble that's that's what i would tell my 10 year old so fantastic well thomas flute hardy this has been a real honor a privilege just an absolute treat talking to you oh i'm honored dude you're an awesome artist i love your work and i'm just honored it's, it's just it's more of a blast to hang uh, with someone who knows what they're doing and, and uh, we, we, we communicate, we connect. And so it's an honor. Thank you very much, my well, friend. Well, thank you. Thank you for being on this episode of The Creative Endeavor. Awesome, dude. Thanks, man. I really hope that you've enjoyed this episode of The Creative Endeavor. And a big thank you to Thomas Fluharty for joining me. Now, of course, if you want to see more of Thomas's work, then check him out online. He can be found on Instagram at Thomas Fluharty and also on his website at www.thomasfluharty.com. I've put those links in the description down below. Make sure you check out his amazing art. Now, of course, if you want to come back for more and see more episodes of The Creative Endeavor, some of my painting tutorials or my new Sketch Endeavor series, then make sure you subscribe to this channel and hit that notification icon so you're notified when I upload another video. As always, you can find me on Instagram and Facebook, but most important, make sure you subscribe through my website at andrewtischler.com. Thank you so much for stopping by, and I'll see you again soon.